Minister of Defence of Estonia, uh, Yuri Luik, uh, and High Representative Vice President Federica Mogherini will briefly present the outcomes of uh, the meeting and then we'll take a couple of uh, questions before we move to the next meeting. Minister, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. And uh, let me use this opportunity also to thank Federica Mogherini for her leadership in this uh, process of developing uh, EU defence. Uh, I think the um, unofficial informal meeting of today uh, had uh, some particularly important issues uh, to discuss. And uh, if I go by our agenda, then uh, the first, perhaps the unique uh, experience we had was to do with uh, cyber defence exercise called Cybri 2017 where ministers were put to a, a fictional situation uh, which was happening with the uh, EU mission, uh, EU military mission. And they had to answer to a list of uh, complicated questions. Uh, we were emphasizing that this was not an exercise to teach ministers to program, but it was, ra was rather to ask them to make to, to provide political solutions to difficult uh, issues which unavoidably are raised uh, in these circumstances. Like if you are attacked, is it a cyber incident, cyber attack, armed attack? Uh, which EU tool would you use in those circumstances? What kind of communication policy uh, would you use? Uh, public release of all information or more sensitivity, secrets, etc., etc. I think ministers enjoyed the, uh, the uh, exercise, and I think uh, this allows us to bring the information we garnered from that exercise also to future exercises, both in European Union and NATO, and also to develop EU uh, cyber defense uh, capabilities. Uh, we had a thorough discussion on uh, Sahel and the Horn of Africa problems. Uh, I'm sure, Federica, you will, you will cover them. Uh, and uh, finally, PESCO, the uh, Permanent Structured Cooperation. I am personally not a fan of that abbreviation, but uh, I think the, uh, the idea itself is great, the, the, the deeper cooperation and what I think was extremely important was that the spirit around the table was very positive, very inclusive. It is pretty clear that I would dare to say most of the EU member states will be or are planning to join. And uh, we, of course, went through a list of uh, conditions or ideas which uh, would be necessary for uh, EU member to, to bring to the table if uh, they want to join. I wouldn't call them criteria, it's more kind of a framework uh, of, of ideas. And finally, European Defence Fund, Estonia is leading a working group which is uh, uh, organising this fund or, or drafting uh, the basic documents of the fund. Uh, obviously, this is a very complicated issue. Uh, and it is extremely important that the money we put to both research and development and capability building would support European defence, would support European defence industry. And the point we made was also that the small and medium-sized industries should be uh, helped uh, by this very programme. But it is all in the works, we hope we can sort of uh, finally sort of open PESCO and the fund at the end of our presidency. Thank you. 
High Representative. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuri. Uh, first of all, for a wonderful hospitality that, uh, uh, let me stress, all the ministers appreciate it enormously. Uh, and also, congratulations for what is uh, so far a very successful uh, presidency. Uh, we have had uh, uh, these three main points on the agenda of the Defence Ministers' meeting, the last one jointly with the Foreign Ministers that will continue their work uh, uh, immediately after this press conference. Um, we had, uh, as Yuri mentioned, uh, a very useful um, exercise uh, on a cyber uh, attack uh, for the first time ever uh, with the NATO Secretary General uh, being invited to observe the exercise. Uh, as we will have an increased role for the European Union in the next NATO exercise. This is the first time this happens, uh, and this is the testimony of uh, a stronger than ever uh, cooperation and coordination between the European Union and NATO in particular on hybrid threats and, and cyber. Uh, on the Sahel uh, and the Horn of Africa, um, all the member states, all ministers expressed strong support uh, to an increased uh, um, work of the European Union uh, in both regions, uh, as both of them are strategically important for the security of the European citizens. Uh, in the Sahel, the European Union has, uh, uh, a few weeks ago, provided the first 50 million euros to the joint force of the G5 countries of the Sahel to uh, prevent and fight uh, terrorist networks and trafficking organizations in the territory. Um, I have uh, uh, seen uh, a large support from um, all member states on uh, um, more presence and uh, a more coordinated presence of the European Union on the security and defense aspects in the Sahel, as well as on the Horn of Africa. As you know there, our main um, uh, work uh, is focusing on Somalia and also with the Operation Atalanta uh, that has been fighting very effectively uh, piracy of the, Horn, uh, of the coast of the Horn of Africa. But let me... Um, focus um, particularly on the last point we had on the agenda, um, because uh, exactly one year ago, uh, in uh, the informal ministerial in Bratislava under the Slovak presidency, I was proposing to the ministers to launch uh, a process to deepen and strengthen uh, EU cooperation on defense. At that time, uh, skepticism was uh, uh, quite uh, uh, the norm around the table. Many observers and also uh, many around the table were expressing uh, maybe appreciation, but uh, some skepticism of the fact that this would have been possible at all, and maybe it would have taken decades. And many remembered the fact that already in the 50s, this was one of the building blocks of the European dream of our funding fathers and mothers, few hidden, but still somewhere there. Uh, instead, one year exactly later, uh, we are um, at a stage that was completely in, not possible to imagine back then. And this is thanks to uh, an excellent uh, teamwork that all member states and all European institutions uh, have managed to make in this uh, last year. And I would like to thank all ministers, but also all the teams that both in Brussels and in the capital cities have been working on this. So today, what we have recorded uh, is uh, a broad consensus of all member states on uh, uh, the uh, European Defence Fund that was proposed by the European Commission to finance and support and incentivize uh, projects on uh, um, research and also on capability developments in the industrial sector including small and medium enterprises, to reinforce the capacity of the European Union uh, to have also strategic autonomy, which is quite important in uh, the complicated and confused times of today's global politics. And also, today we've registered a broad consensus on uh, the main uh, lines of uh, the permanent structure cooperation. Um, so, substantial support for the uh, proposal black on white put on paper on how to launch the permanent structure cooperation uh, with a detailed list of binding common commitments uh, in line with treaty provisions. Now these commitments uh, focus on different uh, elements, investment levels, measures to reinforce operational readiness and capability cooperation. Uh, now we will continue in uh, the coming weeks from now to the end of September to consolidate this list of commitments 
um, finalize the last uh, points that need to be clarified, also taking into consideration the debate mm. of the ministers today. This will be the basis for a common notification of interest of member states to myself and to the Council. I believe this can be achieved already uh, within a, more or less a month, by mid-October. Uh, they would, in this way, inform uh, me and the Council on their intention to participate in a permanent structure cooperation. And in accordance to our treaties, following this notification, uh, we would adopt a formal legal decision uh, that can be negotiated then uh, within the following three months, which brings us to uh, more or less the end of December, the end of the Estonian presidency, when I am convinced uh, permanent structural cooperation can be launched uh, uh, within the European Union. For the moment, just to give you a sense of the interest that member states have shown in this, we have already uh, received uh, proposals for more or less 30 projects that could be developed under permanent structural cooperation. Um, so I believe that this is uh, uh, really going uh, well, on a good track, and uh, uh, with a lot of active uh, involvement from all member states. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, before I give the floor to you, just a note to photographers, if you want to take a family photo of the foreign ministers, you'll need to move in that direction slowly. Now, the questions go to you. When you ask them, please wait for the mic, introduce yourself and the media you are working for and indicate to whom you're posing the question to. I'll start with the gentleman in the white shirt over there. Hi, hello. My name is uh, Lauri Tenkler. I'm with the uh, Estonian daily newspaper, Eesti Päevaleht and uh, Delphi News Portal. Uh, I have a question for both of you. Um, first of all, um, the question to you, um, um, representative, uh, High Representative, is uh, the same criteria that you were talking about um, that, uh, that some of these uh, uh, countries would have to fulfill. Um, um, the European Union has member countries who have vastly different uh, spending, vastly different capabilities. How low does the common den denominator have to go so that there would be a, um, an inclusive, that all member states would be able to mm -hmm. actually join the, the, the permanent structured cooperation? And, and to you, uh, Mr. Minister, uh, it's the, the question is what, uh, you know, if you were uh, to look at this uh, permanent structured cooperation proposals, what additional resources should Estonia put into this, uh, which are not NATO resources or, or member state resources? Is there additional commitments that Estonia should take if we are part of this same PESCO structure? Thank you. I can be very brief. Uh, it is about binding uh, common commitments that member states define uh, among themselves. This is a member states driven. Uh, the role that we have in Brussels is to accompany, uh, prepare, uh, support this process, but it's a, a national government's decision to join in uh, this uh, um, cooperation. Uh, and uh, the uh, level of the ambition uh, that we have seen uh, in these weeks of preparation and uh, again today uh, around the table uh, is high. High ambitions, but also inclusivity. And I would like to stress one point that maybe can uh, uh, be the natural opening for the uh, reply of, of the minister. Uh, it is not, uh, the work we're doing on the European defense uh, is not necessarily about additional resources, but it's about spending together. It's about cooperating then the decision on how much every single member state spends on uh, defence or invests on defence, it's a matter that stays in national parliaments and national governments. What the European Union can provide is a common platform for investing together, and in this manner uh, making the most out of the investments that uh, might be already there or might be increased. This is a national choice. But what we are offering is a platform for joining uh, investments, joining uh, projects, and in this manner overcoming the fragmentation that is characterizing currently, uh, especially the um, environment of uh, um, defense industry in Europe. 
Uh, in this way, uh, the European uh, industrial um, framework uh, in the sector of defence will be uh, enormously um, uh, enabled uh, to play a major role globally, and the European Union would then be, I think, uh, really a credible security provider globally. Thank you. Uh, we are not uh, planning to provide any additional funds, but you have to keep in mind that the Estonian defence spending is already very high. Uh, we are fulfilling the 2% criteria of NATO, and actually we would like PESCO to have either a condition or at least a policy of moving towards 2% of GDP, because we are always saying that although you can economize by joint projects, if you want to raise to a qualitatively new level, you still have to spend more. I mean, the effectiveness, I agree, effectiveness is important, but there is a certain plateau, a certain limit. If you want to go higher than that, uh, you have to spend more money. But obviously, one of the crucial aspects of PESCO slash European Defence Fund is that uh, there will also be common funds available. And uh, the Commission, the European Union, through the Commission, will be investing to projects we are very much looking at the projects which would be uh, technologically advanced, which would be sort of 21st century uh, worth of projects, uh, cyber defense, for instance. But then there will be other projects also which, in fact, could help NATO uh, to operate, which would emphasize the cohesion between two organizations. Uh, we are talking, for instance, about the project which would ease movement of uh, military forces uh, all over Europe, an issue which we have been grappling with both in NATO and in the European Union. Um, I'll take the question for, from the lady in the third row, and I'm afraid that then we'll have to wrap up. Can you please pass on the mic? Uh, I also wanted to specify on uh, PESCO. So would it be more like... Uh, coalition of the willing, administrative coalition of the willing inside EU, or would the aim would still be to include all the EU members? Uh, according to the treaty, uh, it's a permanent structured cooperation, meaning that uh, we would not require unanimity among all the 28. Uh, we could have a group of member states deciding to uh, launch a permanent structured cooperation. So it's on a voluntary basis, and it's established through a qualified majority voting by the Council. Uh, what I have to say is that so far, on the basis of the discussions and the preparation we've had, uh, I see uh, a very large, uh, if not unanimous, uh, willingness of member states to join. Uh, but uh, obviously this will need to be seen in the moment when these commitments will be uh, completely defined, which as I said, I expect will happen uh, already in the coming weeks. The sense of direction today is clearly for a very broad interest in joining a permanent structural cooperation, but again, it doesn't require unanimity, and it's conceived to allow member states that are willing to do more together uh, to do so without uh, needing the unanimity uh, of uh, decision at 28. And this is true for capability developments, for research, for uh, also operational um, decisions that can be taken. Uh, and I believe that uh, uh, this is going to be um, a definitive step uh, towards uh, a European Union defence um, cooperation that uh, so far has been only on paper. I would only add that uh, I totally agree with that. Uh, there will be kind of the political body of PESCO, which, I mean, <laughs> consists of all PESCO members. But I'm sure there will be military operations where perhaps only a smaller group of countries will take part, those who have particular capabilities to participate in that particular operation. So that, that is, I think, the, the easiest model to be, to be used. I'm afraid we'll have to conclude because uh, we have another meeting coming up in a few minutes. But thank you very much uh, for coming and uh, we'll see you again uh, in today and tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> I'm disappointed. <laughs>